thank you so much for having me. You can all hear me, okay? Okay, great. Um, I'm so excited to be here. I was so thrilled when Chris invited me, and I'm so grateful that women, women at Talks at, I don't know, had me. Yeah. <laughs> um, and this is, uh, The Kids Are in Bed, Finding Time for Yourself in the Chaos of Parenting is my most recent book. It came out in early January. It's my third book. Uh, my other two books, one is called MWF Seeking BFF. Um, it was about sort of how hard and awkward it can be to make new friends as an adult. And my second book was called Jennifer Gwyneth and Me, sort of about celebrity obsession um, and women. <laughs> um, uh, I think the subtitle was uh, The Pursuit of Happiness One Celebrity at a Time. <laughs> so it gives you a sense of it. Um, but this book, so basically, as you can probably tell, my uh, books often kind of mirror the course of my life. <laughs> so I wrote the first one after I'd moved to Chicago. And um, this is the first book I've written since having two kids. And it's really about sort of um, the, both like the difficulty of finding time to yourself um, and sort of, and it really digs into the research of why that's necessary and how things have changed and looks at some, some time use stuff. So it's sort of part memoir, part journalism, part um, data. And so I thought I'd do a quick reading, kind of give you a better sense of it and then um, go from there. On the night I decide to sit down and start writing this book, everything seems to be going according to plan. My husband is out of town for work, but my kids are in good spirits. No one is sick or in need of a last minute glass of milk. And it appears that by 8 p.m. I'll have two sleeping, or at least quiet, children, and I'll be able to enjoy some time to myself. At 6.55, I take my two-year-old son, Will, upstairs and go through the usual routine. Two stories, two rounds of Rockabye Baby, and our nighttime refrain that combines the titles of his two favorite books. I love you, I say. I love you, he repeats. To the moon and back, moon and back. All the time, I say, all the time. By 7.15, I'm downstairs giving my five-year-old daughter, Maggie, her five-minute warning. Those five minutes turn into 15. My fault, I got lost in a computer black hole while Maggie played with her paper dolls. But we make it upstairs easily enough, go potty and brush teeth and read two books and sing two songs. We're on track for our usual 7.45 lights out when I finally have one hour to myself before I need to tackle housework and writing work. But then I start our usual hug, kiss, and squeeze routine, and things start to go south. I don't want you to go, Maggie whines. But I have to. You know that, I reply. I give Maggie another hug and kiss and tell her I'm leaving. That's when the tears start. I'm sad, she says. I miss Daddy. Daddy will see her when he gets home tomorrow, I say, but that's not enough. I want to say goodnight to him now. So I do something I never do and offer to call him for a quick goodnight. This, it turns out, is a big mistake. Huge. When my husband, Matt, doesn't pick up, the wailing starts. I'll give you one last hug, I say, then I'm going downstairs. In the kitchen, where I do most of my writing, I look around at the mess left over at from dinner. My plan is to do a quick 10-minute cleanup, then take 60 minutes for myself to lie on the couch and watch a TV show before buckling down to write, load the dishwasher, and get Maggie's lunch ready for school tomorrow. I need that hour to refresh and relax before starting on the next to-do, to gear up for the transition from bedtime mom mode into getting shit done mode. I can hear whimpering upstairs, but they're weak cries. She doesn't have the stamina, I think. Sleep will win eventually. But it's 8.10, and she's usually out cold by now. Four minutes later, the shouting starts. My tummy hurts. My tummy hurts. I climb back up the stairs, and as I enter Maggie's room, my phone begins to vibrate. Hi, Daddy, Maggie answers in between sobby gulps. I'm not tired. I thought your tummy hurt, I think, though I'm certainly not about to remind Maggie of that. Unsurprisingly, the phone call gets her more worked up rather than less. After three more hugs, I relent. I'll get my computer and do my work outside of your room, OK? Maggie nods, knowing she's won this round. Matt would call me a sucker. And so I skip the hour of me time and sit down on the floor in the hall, open my computer in my lap, and begin clacking away at the keyboard, a sound I'm certain Maggie can hear, but maybe finds comforting, evidence that I'm following through on my promise. There will be no couch for me tonight after all, no hour unwinding in front of the TV. While I sit on the carpet, half writing, half listening to the sounds inside her room for indications of slumber, I kill two ants that are crawling across my keyboard. Now I'm one-third writing, one-third listening for sounds of slumber, and one-third willing myself to remember to call the exterminator tomorrow. It's not exactly what I'd planned for the evening. Fifteen minutes later, Maggie's breath, breathing slows down. It's 8.45, and she's finally sleeping. My butt is asleep on the floor of the hallway, and I just sit there, too lazy to move. In general, there has been a shift in how parents use their leisure time. Away from adult-oriented activities, like fishing with buddies or solo manicures, toward kid-oriented ones, like going to see the latest Pixar hit. Parents are likely to report that they enjoy both child and adult-oriented leisure, 
But from the qualitative literature, you get the idea that if you're responsible for your children, the activity is a little more stressful. Duh. I enjoy family bowling in an almost nostalgic, look at us all together, out making family memories kind of way. But it still involves making sure we pack diapers and wipes and snacks and chasing after a two-year-old so he doesn't get knocked over by a 10-pound bowling ball. There's some real joy in that. You can't not smile when your toddler is shrieking and knocking down all the pins. But you're on high alert at all times. I enjoy bowling with Matt or with friends in a much more carefree, let's have a drink and eat some nachos and look at me, I just rolled a strike kind of way. Or gutter ball, but still. When you're out with it, without your child, you're only responsible for you and your own experience. During child-oriented leisure, mothers in particular seem to feel responsible for not just making the arrangements, but also trying to ensure that their children are having a good time and that everyone's happy. I can relate to the inclination to constantly take the emotional temperature of your kids and spouse and guests during family outings. I caught myself in the act just recently when I took Maggie to see her very first musical. We went to see a new version of Peter Pan at the Chicago Shakespeare Theater. We had great seats, Peter flew in the air and sprinkled fairy dust on the audience and the lost boys hung from the ceiling. There was no reason to worry that Maggie wasn't happy. And yet I found myself fighting the urge, not always successfully, to ask her if she was having fun, if she could see, if she could understand what was going on. And isn't that dog Nana so funny? My daughter is not one to sit quietly if she's unhappy, and she was silently staring at the stage, so I should have known all was well. And I did, mostly, but could she see well enough? Was she sufficiently dancing in her seat? Was she having the absolute most wonderful time of her entire life? At one point, I tried to put her in my lap so she could see the stage better, and she climbed back into her own seat. I loudly gasped in her ear when Peter and Wendy first took flight, and she shooed me away. She was doing just fine and didn't need me stage managing the moment. Any mother who has ever spearheaded, say, a family day at the beach, with all the sun blocking and cooler toting and floaty inflating that entails, knows that such an excursion is, well, no day at the beach. It's why parents make sure to say it's a trip, not a vacation, whenever they go on a family getaway. In order to make the trip sufficiently fun for everyone else, you have to constantly check in. And constantly checking in is stressful. And if not stressful, certainly mentally draining. I loved watching Peter Pan with Maggie. It was a memory I will cherish and an experience I wouldn't trade for anything. It was a reminder that time with kids is fun. Of course it is. But it's a different kind of fun. And it was indulgent in its way, too, in that I took immense pleasure in watching Maggie's eyes grow wide at the tick-tock of the crocodile or when Tinkerbell's flash of light shot across the stage. But I also had to negotiate lunch at Navy Pier with my five-year-old, who couldn't decide if she wanted to sit inside or out. And so we went back and forth five times. All these activities are absolutely worth doing. You will find no argument that parents shouldn't spend quality time with their kids. But of equal value, and the thing that experts say will give parents the energy and desire to create those memorable moments, is carving out pockets of indulgence to recharge and remember that we are more than just a human jungle gym or bathroom monitor. Studies show that parents, especially those who are employed, believe they don't spend enough time with their kids. But here's the catch. Parents are spending more time with their kids today than they have in decades. Employed mothers in 2000 spent the same amount of time or more with their kids as stay-at-home mothers did in 1965. And not only has the amount of time we spend with our kids increased, but the amount of quality time with, we spend with our kids, the time spent reading together and playing together, has bumped up too. There is no short changing. Time, arguably our most valuable commodity, is going to our children now more than ever. Another study found that the amount of time you spend with your kids has virtually no effect on their well-being. Quality time with kids is important, to be sure, but more just doesn't equal better. Parents need to give themselves permission to drop the guilt. And not just because we need to be kinder to ourselves or cut ourselves a break or recognize that we're all just doing the best we can. We should stop feeling guilty because time and again, the science has come down to say, we are doing enough. Oh. Thanks. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I think one of the things I, I love about this book so much is that you do a fantastic job combining personal experiences with primary research. Um, I'd love to start by just kind of talking about like, when did this idea come to you? Was it sort of in these moments of personal experience when you thought, wow, I'm, I don't have enough time for myself or I feel like I'm losing a piece of the things I used to love or kind of take us through that journey? Yeah, so the idea came to me actually, Chris and I have know each other because we worked together at a, in a previous life. <laughs> um, and we were working at a tech startup and it was kind of crazy and then I was also working on a book, another book, I do some kind of book collaboration. So I was writing that at night so I'm going to work, coming home, being with my kids, writing all night. And one day I was on the phone with my best friend, my oldest friend, and I was <laughs> telling her about everything I had going on. And she was like, but Rachie, when do you watch TV? 
<laughs> and I know what she meant because like I really love TV. So she, what she was trying to say is like, when do you take care of yourself? When, when's your time for you? And I was like, oh, I don't know. Sometimes I listen to a podcast on my way to work. You know, it was like I was trying to. I was like, every now and then I get out. Um, but it really hit me in that moment. Like, when is that time? And and I would talk to other friends who had kids. Um, you know, primarily moms with both moms and dads who similarly, you know, they had a whole different life experience, they had different jobs, or they even didn't work, but they similar, similarly like felt like there was never time. You know, I'm in a book club and people would be like, I can't read anymore, I don't have time to read, I don't have time to watch this show, or whatever the case may be. So that became something I was thinking about, not just me, but with other people, and so that's sort of where I started to dig in. Yeah, you make a good point here that it's not even just about time, um, that it's also about sort of like, what are you thinking about when you do have the time? Um, is it time when you're actually allowing yourself to be sort of um, free from some of the guilt and the other thoughts? Can you talk about that a little yeah. bit? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that I would say to people, they would say like, well, when do you have time to watch that show or something? And I would say like, what do you do after your kids are in bed? Which is sort of you know where the title came from. And it was always like, oh, I'm just so tired that I just, I can't stop my mind from racing. So it wasn't really that the time wasn't there, that they couldn't find the kind of pockets um, to do stuff, but that they couldn't slow their mind down <laughs> to um, really kind of use that time. You know, I don't even want to say wisely because I think there's like all this pressure to always like doing something with your time that is um, like self-improvement or somehow like productive. And I think there's a lot of value in just doing what you enjoy. And I think part of what I try to kind of uh, fight for in this book is like let go of that guilt too. Like you don't have to use every time to minute to yourself doing something in, like capital I important. You can, if you like watching a show, if you like staring out the window, I mean, there's a lot of value in doing something that makes you happy. Yeah. What are some of the things that you sort of found yourself leaning towards when you were able to think about that amount of time, like some of the specifics of the, yeah. the ways that you spend your time? Well, it's funny. I ended up making, and one of sort of the big tips I give in the book is to make a list, because I think at the end of the day, we're so, we just make so many, especially parents who have you know, you make so many decisions at work all day long, and then you get home and you're making decisions for other human beings. And by the time they're asleep, it's just like decision fatigue. Um, so I had, I had to sit down and kind of make a list of like, what are the things I like to do? So when I have a free minute, I, I don't even have to spend the mental energy of like, what should I do now? So for me, it's, um, you know, reading a novel, watching a show, doing a crossword puzzle, um, exercising, or calling a friend. Um, I've sort of like memorized that. Yeah. But I think it's different for everyone. You know, I talk to other people and it's, you know, some people like crafting, some people, um, you know, and I always say, like, if you want to just go online and do stuff that's, you know, on social media, that's fine, too, as long as you kind of enjoy doing it. I think I heard from a lot of parents who would say, I'm so tired at the end of the day, I just kind of open my phone and I scroll and scroll, and then I put it down and I'm like, what did I just do at the last hour? Yeah. And I think that's, you know, you don't want to go to bed feeling resentful and regretful, and I think that's very common. It, at least it was for me. Yeah, for sure. Um, and you also talked a little bit about, like, this sort of cycle um, that you can sort of find yourself in where, um, you know, I think you made, you made make one point where it's like, you know, if I, if I write a poem, then all of a sudden I can, I, you know, I can fancy myself a poet, and then if I have time to write poetry, well, then shouldn't I be using that time somewhere else? Yeah. Like, um, can you talk yeah. a little about sort of how you get in that cycle of... Um, sort of almost convincing yourself that the time that you do have shouldn't be spent on yourself. Exactly. Well, there's a lot of sort of like labeling. And it was an expert who said to me, she was like, you can read a poem in three minutes. And then you start to think of yourself as the kind of person who reads poetry. And like, if you're the kind of person who reads poetry, you must have time for yourself. So I think it is a little bit about sort of how you identify and frame the time that you have to yourself versus you might be a person who, you know, gets a massage. But if you spend, you know, the whole time on the massage table thinking about all the emails you need to return, um, it's not very relaxing and you're sort of wait, not wasted that time, but you don't you might not look back on that day and feel like, oh wow, I had this one like really indulgent hour. So I think it is a little bit about sort of the framing of it. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to shift and talk about the the research that you used to also sort of validate or um, or sort of add to some of your own experiences because you pulled in a lot of research that had already been done mm -hmm. from scholars, but then you also went at, went about and did your own primary research. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So I worked with a marketing firm and we conducted we wrote and conducted a survey um, of 500 parents nationwide um, to just kind of ask them about their time use and. Um, Everyone in the survey had at least one child under 10, because I think there's just differences. And there was a, uh, kind of your time when your kids are old enough to kind of entertain themselves. They don't want to be with you anymore. Um, um, but so everyone had a child under 10. And we tried to um, ask questions about how do you use your time, and how do you feel about how you use your time, and what do you prioritize? And there were some really interesting takeaways. I mean, to me, the top two 
that really spoke to me was one that 71% of respondents said that their free time didn't feel free at all because they were constantly thinking of everything they could and should be doing. So that speaks to kind of that, you know, what I was saying about the massage table, and that's the concept of mental load that has gotten kind of a lot of play in the, um, a lot of stories about kind of like motherhood these days. Um, because, and mental load is all that stuff we do when we're not actually physically parenting our kids or at work, but you're still thinking about like, oh, I need to order the diapers, or I need to send out birthday party invitations, or did we get the homework packed away? All this, the stuff that, you know, you're thinking about, which is kind of, can be very draining. Um, and the other really interesting finding was that we found 15% of parents, or of respondents who said that they felt great about how they used their time. Um, other parents, you know, one of the, the biggest reasons parents said they didn't feel good about their time was they said their chunks of time were too short, um, or some were, you know, constantly thinking about their, their you know, their uh, day job or other reasons. But the 15%, we called them role models because they felt really good about how they use their time, and they did a few things differently. Um, they prior had they prioritized exercise much more. Um, they prioritized seeing friends much more, which for the general population was like the 13th out of 14 priorities when they had kids. Um, and they deprioritized time online. I love the fact too that I think some of the we, we were talking about how some of the research also highlighted differences in experiences based on, I mean, not all parenting is created equal, not everyone is created equal, right? Um, you know, here, one example I think was uh, working and non-working parents, right? Yeah. Um, can you talk a bit about that difference? The other data I used a lot was the American Time Use Survey, which is a, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, conducts that survey every year, and there's a lot of information about sort of how much leisure time, and actually one of the, to kind of just back up from your question a tiny bit, one of the sort of things that always shocks people is that according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, even the people who are the most time strapped still have what they define as three hours of leisure time a day. Um, and people always find that like, they're like, what are you talking about? I do not have three free hours a day. Um, but it sort of depends a little bit on how you, how you measure it, but that always surprises people. And in that survey, the people who are the most time strapped are full-time working women of kids under six. Um, and even those women had, according to this data, three hours, um, three hours themselves. So there was a question, had someone asked me recently about kind of working versus non-working moms. Um, and I was saying that, you know, everyone basically <laughs> feels this way and uh, kind of an anecdotal, I did a Google survey kind of as a more um, anecdotal uh, gathering resource before we did the official survey. And I was hearing from that, you know, hearing about that a lot. Um, but even, even uh, stay-at-home parents feel super strapped for time. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting there was that a lot of stay-at-home moms specifically felt like they didn't feel entitled to time to themselves because this, you know, raising kids was their job. They didn't contribute financially to the household. So they felt like they hadn't sort of earned time to themselves. So I think, you know, there's a lot of always talk of like the mommy wars, which I think we're luckily kind of moving away from. But as you said, it's not all created equal and everyone parents very differently in just your parenting style or just kind of the way you live your life, if you're working or not, or whatever the case may be. Um, but there's always some factors contributing to why. It's like everyone feels strapped for time and seems to feel guilty <laughs> about taking time for themselves. And I think that's largely because we live in this age of intensive parenting where there's so much focus on like do more, do more, do more for your kids as opposed to like maybe remembering how we need to do stuff for ourselves. Yeah. Were there any factors that sort of rose to the top of the list that really allowed people to actually have more substantial time for themselves. I'm thinking about things like um, access to childcare or being around a community um, that can sort of help provide support. Yeah, I think that people, you know, childcare is a huge part of it for sure. Um, there is something called the parental happiness gap. Uh, research shows, and this is sort of, <laughs> it's like really depressing, but um, that basically your happiness levels drop when you have kids. Um, and it's really <laughs> sad, but true. Like the research they show is just non-parents are happier than uh, parents. And there's a book called All Joy and No Fun, which I, is a really interesting book. And it sort of gets at that idea that like there is a lot of joy in parenting, but not always so much fun. Um, but one of the things the research has shown is like the difference uh, in the countries that they don't have this big happiness gap is uh, childcare and like subsidized childcare across the country. So that is a big point of stress for parents, I think, across the board. And certainly, you know, what I hear from, from parents anecdotally is, you know, if you don't have a support system or can't find um, 
you know, affordable childcare, that's a huge thing. Um, some people, and some people just don't love babysitters. Like, I have come to embrace the babysitter. <laughs> that is, that definitely helps. But, um, you know, and I was, I, my favorite story is a woman who told me that it was a snow day for her daughter, and she kind of was, like, stuck with the kids all day, and she went with her to Ikea. She had an errand to run, and she put her daughter in the play space at the Ikea, and she was, like, she thinks she's, like, at Disney World. She's, like, so happy. And I like spent five minutes buying the you know the doorknobs I needed, and then she was like, now my kid's in the play space, and I'm just reading a book on a couch, like an IKEA couch. <laughs> um, so I think you know there are some hacks in there you can find, but it's certainly, for sure, um, I think a lot of this isn't is is an issue of access. Yeah, and then what about if we kind of sliced the data by gender? Um, so kind of the, is the experience, or did you find that the sort of experience or um, the the ways in which people uh, you know, a thought about the time that they had to themselves or used that time was different was different by gender. Yeah, I think definitely mothers and fathers both, the research shows, feel like they wish they had more time with their kids or feel guilty about how much time they're spending with their kids. Obviously, um, the amount of time that fathers spend with their children has increased a lot over time, and um, that's great. Um, still, mothers are kind of spent doing the, the bulk of the, the work at home, according to the research. Um, but one, you know, one study I, I really love and I kind of always point to is um, there was a study looking at sort of how um, uh, households divvied up what, what uh, one spouse did when the other one was doing housework. And so when um, the mothers were doing housework, dads were often just like relaxing. It was their time. But then when the dads were doing the housework, the mothers were helping out with the housework. <laughs> so. Um, and I think a lot of people see that research and they're just like, ugh, dads. But I sort of think like, all right, that's great. Like, let, we should do that too. The moms should do the same thing. So instead of jumping in, like, if he's, you know, folding the laundry, like, back. It's your time. And I think to me, it's like, okay, there's something to be learned on both, both sides. And I think I, yeah. I take that less as a, all right, the, the dads need to pitch in more as, as um, I think maybe the moms need to give themselves a little more permission to say like, okay, this is my time because someone else is doing the work. For sure. The other thought that I was, thought was really interesting is that you, at, at one point you do sort of kind of switch, um, switch POVs a little bit and talk about the, the kids' point of view. Yeah. Um, and sort of what, what the research says that kids actually want, you know, mm -hmm. from, their, from their parents or the experiences that they have. Can you talk about that? Yes. So, yeah, the research says that basically um, what kids want is less stressed parents, not more time with their parents. Um, the, someone did a survey and, and asked all these parents, like, what, how do you think your work affects your children's life? And all the parents thought the kids were going to say, like, oh, my kids don't have enough time with me. But the thing that, that all the kids said was, I wish my parents were less stressed. And I always, you know, I point to that because I think I can kind of say until I'm blue in the face, like, it's better for you to take time for yourself. And it is, you know, you're kind of more, will feel more sane, you have more to give. Um, you know, it's sort of like a put your oxygen mask on first kind of thing. Um, it's better for everyone, but I think we still, for whatever reason, feel like selfish if we if we kind of take time for ourselves just for ourselves. Um, so I always say, like, it's actually better for your kids. Your kids will be happier. Um, and, you know, I also think uh, we model how we deal with leisure for our children. And one day I was talking to my daughter, and she was like, I was like, let's talk about what we did today. She was like, I already know what you did today. You woke up, cleaned, got the kids ready, went to work, 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 came home, cleaned, went to bed. And I was like, Oy. like, is that what you think that like my life is like or what your life should be like if you have kids? Mm -hmm. um, and there is some research that shows that basically women, that everyone learns, their, develops their attitudes towards leisure from their parents. Um, and the research showed that women basically f think that they are entitled to leisure until they become mothers. And then once they have kids, they don't feel entitled to leisure. And so part of it for me is like, okay, let me think about Maggie and what's going to be good for her. Because I don't want her to think if she decides she wants kids one day that she, the minute that happens, she has to give up everything that she loves. Yeah. Um, you know, the activities she loves and things like that. And, and um, I, I think that it's really great to identify as a parent, of course, but we don't want to give up our whole selves. Um, and lose kind of everything else that we are. Yeah. All right. Any questions out there? You kind of touched on the support systems. Um, so I was wondering if the studies that you looked into looked at, uh, like, say, rural versus suburban versus rural habitation and what effect that might have on your families, your neighbors, your family being close. My data didn't actually look into kind of where in the country you live. That's a really good question. Um, 
So I don't, I don't know the answer to that. You know, it's like, I think my takeaway was sort of like, it's hard for all of us, you know? Um, but that's a, that's a really good question. And I think obviously having access to places in the city where you can, um, where there are more, you know, kids rooms and kind of childcare that you can tap into. Um, you know, one place that I know, uh, religious institutions have a lot of kind of parents night out where you can come in and um, there's a lot of places like that have, uh, you can like drop your kids off. So there are some, um, Things I think available everywhere, but certainly like if you have a you know easy access to a museum that will take your kids and or a gym that you can take your kids and they'll they have childcare, um, I think that adds to it. Um, but at the same time, I think in some um, less urban areas, there's a little still more um, tendency to kind of let your kids like go to the neighbor's house. Like there's I think part of the the reason we've lost a little bit of the time to ourselves is like when I was a kid, it was like just go outside and play, and we don't do a lot of that anymore. Um, there, because of this kind of intensive parenting, and I think there's some level of fear, and there's a whole movement now called free range parenting, which is the movement to kind of let your kids have a little more freedom, even at a younger age, um, which I think does affect it a lot. Like when I had kind of anecdotally asked people, how do you, um, like how is it different for you, and why do you think you don't have time to yourself? A lot of my friends just kind of anecdotally will say, like I don't feel like I can, especially once you live in cities, I don't feel like I can let my kid just like walk to school or just like go out and play in the yard for an hour. Um, so I think that was the thing that really like opened up our time. Um, I was really um, taken aback by the fact that you mentioned about stress versus time at like, you know, time with the kids. Yeah. And was curious about like, cause I'm thinking like there's a kid, like how did the kid that was interviewed or the data, how it was collected, how did they actually describe like the stress that they were observing or I guess was like perceiving from their parent and like were there certain characteristics of like how the parents were operating that really kind of led to like that being how the data came to came to fruition? Yeah, that's a really good question. And that was a, a data done by a woman named Ellen Galinsky. So she did the survey a long time ago. And I think, um, so I don't know the details, but I know she sat down and she kind of like interviewed all these children. And um, I don't know, that was sort of, it, the, that was the most common answer was that like you want your, that they want people, kids wanted less stressed parents, they wanted more attention from their parents. You know, I think for me, one of the big takeaways is like, my daughter is always like, put your phone down. <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh God, yeah. Um, but I, that's a really good question. It's sort of like, what language did they use to describe it that I don't actually have an answer to? Um, but I, I would be interested to kind of to dig into it. Um, but yeah, I think that that was like, to me, that was also the most striking thing because it was, it's always such a surprise. And I, and I spoke to this woman, she was funny, I interviewed her um, on our call. She was like, she, writing an op-ed for like things like the Times and she was finishing it up as I called and I was like, I don't wanna create more stress for you, should we reschedule this? And she was like, oh no, people create their own stress. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> like, it was like, like blew my mind. And I was like, you are so wise. Um, but it was like clear this was someone who'd like studied this for a very long time when she said that to me. Um, and I think, I think that it really just spoke to the the fact that we don't. And she was one who said like you don't. And I want to kind of look in, in here to remember, but you don't need to spend every second with your kids. You just kind of need to be present. Um, and that it doesn't take a huge amount of time to yourself to do that like de-stressing. I think one of the kind of misconceptions is that you need an hour or even like a weekend or a getaway, but, but 20 minutes actually is sort of something of a magic number, um, you know, in terms of recharging. Um, and the book actually is sort of separated into three sections. It's, um, well, four, but how this conversation really about like how, where, where does the time go and how we use our time. And then it looks at the three areas of your life that take the biggest hit when you have kids, which are um, your romantic relationship, uh, self-care and friendship, and how kind of small amounts of time on those things can really help like de-stress and, and make you more present. But I don't know, I anecdotally I find that, because I think you're right, like my six year old's not gonna say like, I would like my mother to be less stressed. Um, I think her language would be a little bit different, but I think she'd be getting at that point of like, she needs to calm down. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. I'm curious, um, after writing the book and doing all this research and going through the results, did you have you noticed meaningful differences in how you spend your time and the free time that you have at night? And if you could tell us a little bit about that. I'm yes, curious. yes, that's a great question, and I absolutely have. And it's not that I do anything, I, I wouldn't say I do anything that different, but I'm very deliberate, I think, about how I use my time. Um, sometimes I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do 
the dishes now and like I'm gonna give that like 20 minutes and like spend the next 20 minutes kind of cleaning up and then I'm gonna take time for myself. I'm gonna read a book or um, watch a show. Um, I think I make, so it's, it's more deliberate kind of in the time I, I spend on doing the other stuff instead of like puttering around kind of, which is a thing that I would do, like moving a water bottle from like one shelf to the next and then like suddenly it's bedtime. <laughs> like what did I just do with the last hour? Um, I'll kind of try to make a deliberate choice of what I'm gonna do whether that is for myself, a kind of a, um, like what I call pockets of indulgence, um, or if it is uh, kind of the housework or the work. But I, I do try to, I mean, I don't necessarily time myself, but I try to say like, okay, like until nine o'clock, I'm gonna do this um, housework or whatever, and then I'm gonna do, a, you know, exercise instead of kind of, I try, you know, we're all human, and I, but I try not to spend my time um, just kind of, like looking on my phone for no reason or staring at the wall, which is like a thing sometimes. Um, but the, you know, pockets, what I call pockets of indulgence, that's kind of a term I in, uh, introduced in this book. And part of the reason for that, as opposed to just like me time, is I like the idea of there being a beginning and an end. Because um, I think when you say to someone like, you should just take time for yourself, make some me time, it feels kind of nebulous and intimidating because you feel like you're supposed to do something really important with that time and also that like, there's all this other stuff I need to get to, and so you wait until you've gotten everything, you finish everything on the list until you, to get to the stuff for you. And as we all know, like the, the list is never done. There's always new things. If you get something off, people always say like, when I was interviewing for this book, um, when I had, especially this was actually another kind of gendered thing I found, that a lot of women, when they found time to themselves, would still just try to get stuff done for the family so that like they had more time later on, whereas the dads, would say like, okay, I've done what I need to do for parenting and this is my time for myself. And they felt less guilt about just taking the time for themselves for themselves. Um, whereas a woman, the moms would say like, oh, I went to Target by myself because it was a little easier and hopefully the time would free up later in the week, but it just never did because something else came up that they felt like they should be doing. Or they'd get a manicure and then they'd be like, oh, all the things I should have done with that time, which is like, how much can you get done in 30 minutes anyway? Um, so that's why kind of this idea of pockets of indulgence, I always say like pick a time frame, you know, 20 minutes, an hour, whatever the case may be, and then like the dishes will still be there and all the other stuff will still be there and you can get back to it. And so I think you feel a little more free to kind of actually lean into the time to yourself and like take it because you know like I will get back to it. And the best case scenario, you kind of engage so much in whatever you're doing in that kind of flow state that you do it longer and that's like not that bad. <laughs> that's a good thing. Um, one thing you said that blew my mind was that working moms today are spending as much time with their kids as stay-at-home moms in the 1960s. So I would love your perspective and opinion, or maybe you did research on this as well, but what, what do you think that says about either our workplace and our work life today, or what do you think 1960s moms were doing differently? <laughs> yeah. I um, would love just more insight. Yeah, I agree. To me, that's like always the thing that like really, when I found that out, I was like, oh my God, I need to write this book. Because I think that we all look back at the 60s as like the golden age of parenting and family, and we thought we were all like together. But, you know, I always joke like, if you watch like Mrs. Maisel, she's like never with her child. <laughs> like, so the kid is like never around. And I, so I think in the 60s, there was a lot more acceptance of um, like, it's okay, like childcare, like being, you know, there are a lot of like ladies who lunched and um, that wasn't, there was a lot less, I believe, like parent shaming and judgment happening um, than there is today. And I think today there's a lot of guilt surrounded of, you know, I think we have working parent guilt of because I'm working. I think if you were a stay-at-home mom in the 60s, you probably didn't have that guilt because you were at home. So you're like, well, I'm always like it. I'm a stay-at-home mom versus today. There's this push-pull of, oh, I want to you know, do everything for my kids. And we do live in this age of intensive parenting where there is this kind of, you know, with the whole like college admission scandal, there was a new phrase called snowplow parenting of just trying to like get all obstacles out of the way for your kids all the time. And there's this idea that the more time we spend with our kids, um, the better their outcomes are going to be. And that's why that study that was like more time with your kids doesn't actually translate to better outcomes I think was so important because I think there's there's just so much guilt wrapped up into it but in reality because of that guilt we're going home and like being with our kids every second we can and trying to like you know give do flashcards with our babies um, and trying to do trying to get it all in there's this idea that like we should do it all um, that I think can be kind of detrimental to everyone um, 
when in fact like we're all probably better off just taking like a little bit of time for ourselves. And yesterday I watched my daughter, I was like saw her staring out the window and I was about to be like, Maggie, what are you thinking about? And then I was like, no, this is what that guy, like one of the researchers I interviewed for this book, I was, he had made some joke about like, maybe it's okay to let your kid like crawl off for a few minutes. Maybe he's not gonna roll in glass. Maybe it's okay if your kid like looks out the window. And I was like, oh, I should let her like have this moment of thought and quiet. And um, I think that that's like hard for us because we're trying so hard to help them kind of grow up into these like successful, great people. Thanks so much for being here. I read your two other books and I oh love my God, them. I, love I haven't heard you talk once and I went up to you and I was like, I want to be your best friend. Oh my God, um, we, we are, we're, <laughs> obviously we're best friends. This is amazing, I love you. Thank you. Um, but I just tell everyone, first of all, like I just got back from a girl's trip. I have three kids under six. Um, and Whoa. it was the best. And like I did feel guilty about going, but oh my god, it's so much fun. <laughs> so yes. like, it's, it, it is, it's so important to feel recharged, right? Um, but something that I was just thinking about is I try really hard to like do the watch a show with my husband. I wake up really early to work out because it's really important to me. I leave work at five so I can then spend quality time with the kids and I don't look at my phone. And then I do that little bit of housework and try to time myself. But then I'm up till really late every night and yeah. I, I think that the thing I'm losing is sleep mm -hmm. and so just interested if like you found that at all yeah because that's the thing I'm sacrificing right now to like do some of the things that you're talking about yeah absolutely um well for I will answer that question but I want to say I've had the same experience going on a girl's trip and I think part of it is always like when you get so caught up in the routine of your life you're like oh I, I don't have time or I can't get away and then when you get back you're like oh my god that was so I like you can't believe the benefit it has. And I had that experience, I wrote about it in this book a little bit of like, I went on this trip with my friends from college and came back and was like, walked in the house and they were like, or even sometimes if I take an hour to go, you know, eat a sandwich by myself and read a book and I come home and they're like, can we make cupcakes, oh my God, and I'm like, okay, yeah. And I'm like willing to do those other things that if after a long weekend, when I'm exhausted and I'm just like at my wit's end, I'm like, no, we're not gonna like make cupcakes right now. It's Sunday, <laughs> like leave me alone. So I do think that I totally agree with you. And to your point about sleep, yes. There's, so one of the sections in this book is about self-care and there's a whole chapter kind of about what I call like exercise and other responsible choices. Like most of the stuff is about all the things we wanna do, but there is, um, you know, going to the doctor and getting enough sleep and the other things that get sacrificed. Um, and I think to your point, you know, the thing that jumped out at me when you were saying that is I always say, like, it doesn't all need to be fit in a day, right? If you can do um, see a friend one day or, like, spend an hour with your spouse another day. Um, I think when we try to fit it all in, um, in the 24-hour period, it can be a lot. And sometimes, like, then we suddenly were sacrificing sleep. And I talked to a lot of sleep experts here who were talking to me about, you know, like, shutting down no screens before an hour before going to sleep. And I was like, that's just like not realistic for most people's lives. So kind of what are, what are other hacks? Because sleep is just, sleep is a form of self-care, absolutely. I, you know, I believe that. And um, it's funny because people will say like, so a one mom said to me, you know, I don't, I don't get enough sleep but it's because I love to watch TV. And by the time I watch all the TV, I have to watch, then I go to bed. And it's like a little bit about, again, like framing. I was like, well, but you're, that's a ch choice you're making. You don't have to watch that TV. And there's something wrong with that. I love to do it. But I think, so she wasn't even thinking of it as like a fun thing. Like I like watching this TV. She just like considered it like an obligation. And so it was like another thing she had to do because she just thought of herself as that kind of person. Um, but I think that, yeah, that's really, that's like one of the hardest things. This one mom said to me, she said, I get up at 5 a.m. to do a boot camp class, but that means I have to get up at 5 a.m. So I'm like, the only way to give to myself is to also steal from myself. Um, which like really struck me because I think that that's a kind of a thing that a lot of parents, especially moms, grapple with. Um, and I think my like tip or my, my learnings would be to not feel the pressure. Like I always say you should take a little bit of time for yourself every day, but it doesn't have to be hours and hours every day. And it's okay if you don't spend that full hour with your spouse or you don't work out. I mean, it's different for every person. I don't, but I think to try to fit it all in you know, work and life and kids and all the three areas of self-care and relationship and friendship every day is, you're gonna, it's gonna stop feeling, again, stop feeling relaxing or like indulgent and start feeling like just another to do. So it's sort of balancing that, like doing all the stuff I wanna do, but also part of self-care is sleeping and feeling sane, <laughs> you know? Hi, thanks Hi. for being here. Um, Thank you. So I'm a chronic multitasker. Yeah, Oh. And so my question is, for example, I strategically fold my laundry um, the same night that my favorite TV show is on. 
And so I just wanted to get your thoughts around, like, is that effective? Is it not? No. Okay, great. <laughs> um, yeah, just if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, no, I'm just teasing. I appreciate that question very much, and I do the exact same thing, and I write about that here, about that one of the things that's sort of stealing from our pockets of indulgence and our free time is multitasking specifically because all the research says that basically like we think we can multitask and we can't and it just makes everything take longer. Um, and I write specifically about folding the laundry, watching Law and Order SVU and how like that's, I always am like, well, I can do this, but I, it's a perfect activity to do. But then, you know, while I watch a show so I can not feel guilty about watching TV, but I can also enjoy folding the laundry. Um, and, and in reality, like then I kind of miss part of the show and then I need to rewind to rewatch it because I was paying attention to like the piles. Um, and just being that like, it's just not effective. It takes us longer to do the, the, the chore and we're not as engaged and enjoying the thing that we're trying to enjoy. Um, and yeah, the research really does show that like everything takes longer and if we're, and when our attention like at work is if you're working on a task and then someone, you know, pops by your desk to talk to you about something, it, it takes like a significantly longer time to j jump back into that. Um, but I think that that's a very common, um, thing that we all think we can do, myself included. Um, but I would say that to the person who said, like, how else has your behavior changed, that that is something that I think I have, I hope I have gotten a little bit, I have changed a little bit. Like, I try to, like, do what I'm doing and not do three things at once or even, I'm just like, I'm kind of just gonna, like, fold the laundry. And it actually does take a lot less time. <laughs> and then I can just, like, so in the, in the end, I guess it takes the same amount of time to do both things, but I, like, do the laundry, I'm done, and then I, like, lay on the couch and really watch the show and enjoy it. So. Um, I think it is very, very common, and there's a zillion articles about it, but the, the reality is that no, it's kind of not the best <laughs> method. When you were talking about uh, one partner doing a task and the other partner just kind of chilling out, yeah. and then when the other happens, the other partner is kind of like doing help, I was wondering if you have any tips about creating that environment for like the non-stressed partner for their stressed out partner, <laughs> of how can I create that environment where they don't feel like they need to also be doing something and they can just watch Love is Blind or, or do whatever they're doing while I'm, I'm doing tasks and they don't feel like they also have to do stuff. I love that. I mean, I think the fact that you're asking the question means you're probably already like doing some, a lot of things right. Um, but I think just saying it, you know, like sometimes I, I, I know I'm like constantly pointing to research, but I think um, part of it is just because I'm like, see, it's not just me, like this proof, you know. Um, but I think saying, you know, it's okay, I'm doing this now, you don't need to jump in. I think there's like there's this interesting thing uh, with couples sometimes, especially um, with like moms and dads, where you know there's this phrase called maternal gatekeeping, where mothers try to kind of control the way in which dads play with the kids, but there's also the same idea of like, if I'm folding the laundry and then my husband tries to do it and then I'm like, oh, that's not the way to do it. And then I'm just like, you should do it this way and try to control how he folds the laundry. Um, and then he says like, well, why don't you just do it yourself? <laughs> and then suddenly you're not, you know? And if I just let him fold the towels, however he wants to fold the towels, I can get that time to myself. So I think kind of calling attention and saying like, hey, I'm, I'm doing this now, like, it, it's okay. Like, you do your part, I do mine. I, you don't need to feel guilty. Like, I want you to, um, watch Love is Blind, like enjoy yourself, you deserve it. And I think that is very um, kind and generous and uh, what we should all be doing um, because we're all, you know, even in uh, equitable kind of gender equitable households, once kids are involved, the research shows that the woman just starts, the mother starts doing so much more. Um, so that even if you're like equitable in household labor before you have kids, I think it's the women start doing three times as much as the men after the kids or after having kids. So um, I think just calling attention to it and saying like, hey, when you do what you're gonna do, I'm gonna watch whatever I wanna watch or read or do whatever I wanna do. And so like, let me do this and like, it's great. Um, I think the maternal gatekeeping, someone Chris and I worked with once showed me his wife was going away for a trip and she left him like, I counted, there were 23 notes hanging around the kitchen of like how to do everything with the kids. And it like blew my mind. Um, and you know, if you're like a stay-at-home parent, you sort of have a routine and you want things to be kept in, in that way. But um, it's actually probably like maternal gay feeling is, like, is really a problem because it kind of actually inhibits how um, you know the other parent can play, can interact with the kids and feel like confident in their parenting. Um, and I think it's the same thing with like housework. You know, part of the job is for us both to pitch in, but also for us both to say like, I trust you to do your part. 
And there's a connection there, I think, between what you were talking about before in terms of like mirrored behavior, how your leisure time presents to your kids. Yes, right? absolutely. Yeah, like modeling that. And it was, it was interesting because I remember um, one woman being like, I just really want to do a lot of chores in front of my sons because I want them to like understand like doing chores. But, but exactly, it's also the flip. Um, but I think the more you can just like say out loud, like, hey, it's OK. Um, I'm going to do this. Uh, a lot of um, one relationship expert I talked to said that like the actual thing that's the most effective, which was kind of, you know, I was like, oh, you need to go on date nights probably or this and that. And he was like, actually, it's sort of like the invisible support that you provide. So doing things, he was like, if I talk to a couple who have a young baby and say to the wife maybe, um, you know, what has your husband done to support you um, as a parent, for example. And she was like, I don't know, nothing really, but he's like, oh, I've done all these actual things. Like those, you know, actually I took the baby for a walk when uh, she was sleeping or this and that. In couples where that invisible sport is happening, which is to say you're like doing, sm making small gestures to help the other person that you're not necessarily calling attention to, those couples are actually the happiest. So like when that invisible support, which I was like, oh, I should probably stop being like, did you see that I did this other thing? Did you say thank you? <laughs> Aren't I so great? <laughs> so, that was my big takeaway. Does the guilt ever go away and it just takes like practice to do it? Or is it like always there and you just have to block it? <laughs> I think it's, a, I mean, I think that's a great question and I think it's a little bit of a combination of both. I mean, I, it's funny because I was about to be like, I don't feel guilty, but that's, <laughs> that's not really true. I mean, I, I don't and I do. And I think I, I know sort of intellectually. Um, and I try to say because of the, you know, the conversation we had about modeling, I say to my daughter, like, I'm going to book club tonight. Or like, I'm, I don't say like, I'm going out or I need to do work. I try to be like pretty clear um, about what I'm doing. But also, yes, yeah, sometimes I'm like, oh, I was away a lot. And my husband will be like, there's a book about this. It's fine, <laughs> you know? Um, so I do think that there, it's sometimes always there or it's like in patterns. Like sometimes it'll be one week where I just feel like I've taken more time to myself than I wanted to or felt guilty because it was a couple of days in a row or I wasn't home. Um, but I think, I think it does go away because I see that there's no change in how much my kids want to be with me and are happy and when I'm around. And it doesn't feel like, oh, they're less engaged with me as a parent. Um, and again, I'm not saying like everyone should like ditch their kids <laughs> and like never be around at all. I think it's just sort of a matter, a matter of actually realizing that you can take small chunks of time for yourself that you probably have anyway, but are not leaning into or not kind of letting go of all the other stuff. Um, and to me, that was sort of the, the most interesting thing is, or one of the most interesting things is that this time exists. We're just, when I started writing this book, someone was like, oh, now everyone's just going to feel guilty about one more thing. Um, oh, like not using our time to ourselves well. And I'm like, no, it's not about um, using it in any specific way. It's just like not constantly, you know, feeling, thinking about a thousand other things. So I think paying attention when, when uh, these kind of pockets of time show up. Like sometimes you find yourself with a free half hour because you know, the kids are all suddenly one's at a birthday party and another one's sleeping and like what, that's like when that list comes in handy. Um, and I think kind of really leaning into those times. So you don't always have, to, the reason it's called the kids are in bed is I don't think you need to always take the time away from your children. It could be when they're sleeping but just, or the, when they're in school. Um, but using that time in a way that feels good I think is really important. Um, so I think it's a combination. I think it's like parenting is always, there's always some level of guilt, um, but I'm at least able to kind of rationally say to myself, like, it is okay. And they are always very excited when I come home. <laughs> That's always good. Um, one final thought, yeah. just in relative to, uh, or in relation to this idea of guilt and parent shaming, just the role that social media can play in that. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Social media is tricky because we all like want to show our kids off, <laughs> um, but there is kind of this, perfection on, online of like showing, you know, you don't show the hard times. And I think things are getting a little bit better. When I, I used to work um, uh, many moons ago at Yahoo and when Yahoo had a parenting website and uh, we had a no shame parenting movement. Um, and it was this idea of kind of letting go of all the like mom guilt or mom shaming happening. Um, but I think the, the more we can, I think one, just like use social media when you and actually like want to like make a choice like I want to go on whatever app I want to go on right now um, so that you don't feel in terms of like feeling guilty about how you use your time so you don't feel guilty but then in terms of the kind of shaming aspect I think the more we can kind of be honest about like what the whole story is um, the better off everyone is I think it's, it's hard you know to see all these pictures like 
parents posting pictures that everything, I'm like, oh my god, they like really have it all down. <laughs> and it's, you know, none of us have it all figured out. I'm sure we all know that, but it's, it's hard to, to remember that sometimes when we're looking yeah. at social. Well, thank you so much. Let's give Rachel a big round of applause.